Hello, this is Georgina Rose, part-time esoteric content creator and part-time center of pestilence, and welcome back to the Dot Darling YouTube channel. On this channel, we discuss magic, mysticism, religion, the occult, and everything on the fringe of esoterica. And to get to know a little bit about me, I am Georgina, I'm a Thelemite, I'm an occultist, I'm a ceremonial magician, and I talk about things that are part of the Western esoteric tradition. And in this video, we're going to be talking about prayer. This is something that I haven't talked about yet, but it's something that's super important. So let's break into it. So praying. I think when people think of praying, a lot of people who grew up in the West were raised Christian um, or in one of the other Abrahamic faiths, and they think of their childhood, right? They think of going to church and you're sitting in the back of your like mainline Protestant church and they start talking about the importance of prayer. And so when people leave Christianity, become an occultist, or if they decide to transition into a form of Christian-based esotericism, they're like, okay, well, where does prayer fit in? Do I need to pray again? And for some people, it's something that they kind of struggle with. They're like, oh, well, prayer is Christian. That's not true. Prayer has existed in so many cultures and traditions, and it is certainly not something that Christianity has a monopoly on. It is something that anyone can apply. And Aleister Crowley, the founder of Thelema, who is one of my personal heroes, said, inflame thyself in prayer. Prayer is actually a critical part of any successful spiritual practice, and prayer can look in a variety of ways. So let's talk about the ways people pray. So the first way to pray is to simply, you know, get on your knees, get into a position. Some people do things called prostrations, which is a specific posture. Um, or you can just do it standing, sitting in your bed, however it is you want to, and just put your hands together or your hands like this or like this, whatever you want to do with your arms or hands. And you just start sort of talking to the spirit you want to talk to. You start explaining things and petitioning. But prayer can be a little more complicated than that. That's, of course, the intuitive way to pray. And I believe Aleister Crowley at one point said, sometimes even just getting on your knees with no preparation, with no sort of technique behind it, and just giving your heart out to divinity can be just as powerful as any proper ritual. But that is not the only way to do it. And I think if you want to progress really far, you're probably going to want to experiment with different ways to pray. The next would be using some sort of prayer beads or ropes. So a lot of traditions have their own version of these, most popular obviously being the rosary, but there are also the mala beads in traditions of the East. I really like the mala beads personally, um, where you basically you say your prayer while you're feeding the beads through your hands like this. When you do this, you're typically doing some sort of mantra or some sort of longer prayer that has different components, right? Like for me, I really like mantras. So I will take my mantra. Um, there are a lot of really good mantras that I really like in this book called the Pagan Book of Prayer. I'm going to link it down below. I really like it. I don't know the author. They haven't sent me the book. I bought it myself. So no tie there. But it has this like section where it's just a bunch of mantras to different deities, right? So whatever deity you're working with, you do a mantra for them and make that a devotional practice every day. I recently took this one class. And as part of the class, you have to do this mantra every single night to the spirit the class is about. And I find that that alone helps you get closer to the spirit as well when you're doing sorts of mantras. It can be really helpful to visualize like a sigil or an image or an icon or be in front of an icon of the spirit you're doing the mantra to. Um, some people like to visualize. I know in certain traditions you get your little like icons, like if you notice Orthodox and Catholics tend to have these icons. Um, and pagans, you have these altar statues. I know everyone wants to get the little altar statue of every deity they work with, and those can be used as sort of an icon to focus on while you do your mantras. As well, there are petitions. This is what I think a lot of occultists, particularly those who are really into results-based magic, tend to focus on, which is where during your prayer, you say your prayer, and then you say, I petition this, and you will say the prayer for a set number of days, um, and that will be repeated. Uh, I know a lot of people do this with novenas, in the Christian traditions where they will have a prayer and they'll read it for nine days. Uh, in pagan traditions, you see this in various forms where you will say a certain, say, Orphic hymn. For me, during the entirety of Mercury Retrograde, uh, which Mercury Retrograde is probably over when this video comes out, I pre-film for reference, I've been saying the Orphic hymn to Mercury every single night. So repeating prayers for a set number of time can be a working in and of themselves. As well, there are some prayers that you do multiple times a day. As a Thalamite, there's this thing we do called Libaresh, or solar adorations, where uh, four times a day we say this prayer to sort of solar aspects of the tradition as we follow the cycle of the sun. And that is a devotional act. There's a similar one in Islam, but I am not an Islamic expert or too versed on it, so I'm not going to get into the specifics of how that prayer works and whatnot. But many traditions recommend praying multiple times a day. So how often should you pray? Well, it depends on what your goal is. So if you're doing something like a novena, obviously you do the prayer for nine days. If you're doing magic using the Psalms from the Bible, which I'd love to do a video about at some point, a lot of times I'll do it for 13 days, nine days, 
sometimes even longer depending on your goal. As well, if you're sort of making your own prayer on this type of concept, like say you're doing a martial working, maybe you will take the Orphic Hymn to Mars. I'm super, super partial to the Orphic Hymns. I adore them. And you will say that for a number that corresponds to Mars. For those who don't know, each planetary body has a set of numbers that correspond to them. If you want to know numbers and correspondences, because I think that's really helpful when you're getting into prayer, uh, two books that can help you with correspondences would be Liber 777 by Alistair Crowley and The Llewellyn's Complete Book of Correspondences. Those are my two correspondence reference books. And with those books, I will say, okay, I want to work with, say, Hecate. What are numbers that correspond to Hecate? I'll pull out these books and I will flip through it and I'll find the number and I'll say, okay, well, I'll do the prayer for this long. As well, if you're in a devotional relationship, say you have a patron or a matron, for those who don't know, in paganism is very common, especially those who are into like Wicca and Wicca related traditions. I'm gonna say this is a caveat really quickly. A lot of people who are Western modern neo-pagans have Wicca influence on them, whether they come as a Wiccan or not. They'll have what is called a patron or a matron, which is basically a patron and a matron, which is where you have one masculine deity and one a feminine deity you work with. You devote yourself to those. And for those, you would want to pray every single day to that deity, right? You'd want to develop that relationship deeper and deeper. When you're trying to work with any sort of spirit, prayer can deepen that relationship. Because obviously the big rituals you're not doing every single day. You're not every day doing a full invocation of the spirit. So it's really helpful to pray every day to keep that relationship strong and powerful so that it can grow and develop. For me, in terms of prayer, I of course do rest, which is multiple times a day, but I do the bulk of my prayer at night before I go to sleep. This is just kind of because of how my schedule works. I find that I have the most time to pray in the evening. And for me, I like unwinding with my occult practice. So every night I'll brush my teeth, I'll, you know, do all my nightly routine, and then I will go and pray. I'll do my midnight liver rush. And then after that, I'm going to do my, all my prayers. I do a couple, I do a sort of daily prayer that sort of honors the whole day and sort of prepares me for bed. Um, I'll do a prayer based on the moon phase. One thing that I found really cool when I got a copy of the Pagan Book of Prayer about a year ago is, maybe it was more than a year ago. I think I've had that book for a while. But anyways, they have these prayers to each moon phase. So while I'm honoring, honoring the sun throughout my day when I'm doing Resh, I'm also at night honoring the cycle of the moon. So I'll do a prayer for the new moon, then one for the waxing moon, then one for the waning moon, and one for the full moon. And I don't say them every single day. I say the moon prayers whenever it's at that phase. Uh, and that sort of connects me to that lunar cycle. So in a way, even through prayer, I'm getting that solar lunar balance because it's really important when you're working with anything planetary related in magic to balance it out. Much like you know how the yin yang looks when you're a kid, there must be darkness and light and light and darkness. It's important to have balance or things get uneven and it's very disorienting. It's so important to remain grounded and balanced in any sort of spiritual practice, no matter what your tradition actually is. As well, in terms of picking what prayers to do, it will probably be changing. I know for some people, there are some prayers that they will always do, right? They'll have a specific thing that they do from birth to death. They'll always come back to it. For me, even though it's not a prayer, uh, a ritual that I've been doing every day since I was like 16 is the Lesser Banishing Ritual of the Pentagram. I always come back to it. It's something that I always return to. And I actually say it at the end of my nightly prayers right before I go to sleep. It's my last ritual of the day. Um, and for me, there are some prayers that have sort of become like that. Uh, some spirits that I've worked with for so long, those prayers have kind of just integrated into my constant practice. But there are other prayers that are going to change. Let's say you're doing a specific working using the Psalms, right? You're going to read, I'm just going to pick a random Psalm, 32, right? You're going to read Psalm 32 for a set number of nights. And you're also going to use a corresponding oil and use like some sort of bath or light a candle while you're doing it or something, right? right? That'll be for a set number of times. Then you're going to move to something else or you're going to just return to your sort of daily prayers. As well, people's prayers changed throughout the seasons. Actually, in there's a few grimoires that say this, uh, that your ritual should look different at different points of the year. And for those who recognize the Wheel of the Year, which is a Wiccan idea where you honor different Sabbaths depending on the time of year, or if you're into sort of any older European pagan tradition, you're going to notice there are set holidays that honor times of the year. Your spiritual practice will probably change over the year, and the prayers you're doing will change as well. I know some people, if they say you work with Persephone, right? They're probably only going to work with Persephone in specific ways during whether she's with Hades or not. So when Persephone is out, you'd work with her differently than when she's down with Hades. Or if you're someone who has a very seasonal practice, maybe you'd work with solar stuff only in the summer, or you'd work with Saturnian stuff only in the winter around Saturnalia, which is the same time as the winter equinox or something like that. Uh, I know one of the books in the Lamegiton, which is part of the Keys of Solomon, actually has the person who is partaking in the magic radically change their practice depending on the time of the year, not even allowing them to use the same tools, which 
I find a little extreme. Uh, there's a reason why I haven't worked with that section of the Keys of Solomon because I think that's a little overkill. But there is this idea of changing with the seasons that I find really valuable. I know if you're someone who uh, celebrates the Wheel of the Year, you know that Samhain, the one that is the same time as Halloween, and is the Sabbath that everyone seems to care the most about, there's this heavy emphasis on ancestors. Now, let's talk about spirits you can pray to, because this is something I wanted to talk about, because I actually got, and this would inspire the whole video, a TikTok comment that said, okay, I'm a pagan who doesn't work with deities. Who do I pray to? Does prayer have any place in my life? And the answer is yes. I do not exclusively pray to deities. There are so many types of spirits you can pray for. Of course, you can pray for deities. You can pray to God if you're an Abrahamicist, but you can also pray to saints. If you're someone who's into the Abrahamic stuff or you're someone who's a big syncretist, because there are many traditions that actually syncretize paganism with Abrahamic practice, you see it in all sorts of traditions, you could pray to saints for intercession. Note, when you work with spirits that are not deities, you're going to pray slightly differently. The word intercession is used a lot, which is basically asking a spirit to intervene on your behalf. As well, you can pray to angels. Angels are something that so many people work with and angels come in a variety of forms. I've made a video specifically about the Holy Guardian Angel and the Enochian Angels, if you wanna check back on my channel about that. But there are actually other types of angels. There are Shem Angels, there are Archangels, and they all are worked with pretty differently. They're not the same. It's important with angels to talk about those classifications and how they vary. I'd love to make videos on either of those other types of angels. Comment below if you want that. But with angels, when you pray to them, you're often praying for them to intercede, right? Because angels are underneath gods. They're not the same as gods. They work differently and they're oriented differently. So you're gonna pray to them differently. And within the subcategory of angels, you'd work with say a holy guardian angel different than you would an archangel. And interestingly enough, if you even wanna work with your holy guardian angel, you have to do prayers to get there. So prayers are actually incredibly important on any form of spiritual development. Let's say you're a Thelemite who really wants to do the HGA because in Thelema, the idea of connecting to your holy guardian angel, which is an angel given to you by the gods from your birth to your death is really important. It's heavily stressed. And that's one of the reasons why people even engage with the Thelemic paradigm to begin with. To do that, you actually have to pray. Almost every path to communicate with this type of spirit, which this, this type of spirit appears in multiple traditions. It's not like a Thelema thing. Uh, you see it mentioned in, uh, of course, Mathers, who was not a Thelemite, talked about it. He translated the Abermelon. He is the reason why we have the Abermelon, which is a very popular ritual to connect to your HGA. But you also see it mentioned as the daemon in Hellenistic traditions. And actually, I got an Orthodox Christian prayer book a while ago, and I was flipping through it, and I noticed there was a canon to the guardian angel. And I actually talked to some of my cultist friends about it, and some of my were Christian friends, and they actually think the holy guardian angel and that guardian angel are the same. So even in that tradition, you still are praying to get the angel. The angel will not sort of appear itself to you without um, praying to it. Of course, the HGA is kind of complicated because the HGA is actually still connected to you even if you're not praying to the HGA. It's more about developing knowledge and conversation with the HGA than like reaching out to the HGA. It's complicated, but you see what I mean? Like even with that, instead of you're trying to reach it like you would if you're doing say a Orphic hymn to Mars, right? You're doing that and you're burning that incense to connect to Mars, to reach to Mars. Or if you're doing your deity prayers, you're doing that to deepen that spiritual connection. Whereas if you're doing the HGA thing, you're doing it to develop knowledge and conversation. So even your intention is different. Uh, as well, many people pray to their ancestors. People, when they're talking about ancestor work, it's not the same as you would work if you're working with a god, right? Ancestors are not gods, though in a few traditions, there are these ideas of like collective ancestry forming what are essentially gods, but that's really complicated. And I don't think I have time to get into that in this video, but generally you would work with those differently. So when you're praying to your ancestors, you would do that differently as well if you're working with whether it's a collective ancestry idea. For me, sometimes when I cast circles, I am like to the ancestors of occultism, to people who paved the lineage, people who built civilization, all that. But sometimes I'm praying to a specific family member that's past. I had a family member pass relatively recently and praying with that ancestor has been really healing for me as I process through the grief. In terms of what to say in prayers, okay, I get it. I think prayer is important. I understand that I need to inflame myself in prayer so that my aura can get metaphysically swole. And I think I'm gonna go to cultist. Where do I get prayers? Well, this depends. There are the Orphic hymns. There are modern pagan hymn books too that I can think of is the Pagan Book of Prayer and Hymns to the Gods. I'll put the author's name and those books down below that are full of hymns. Uh, you can also write your own hymns and your own prayers. I found this is a really devotional thing for me. I put some of them on my Patreon ritual guides, but I find sometimes just sitting down and writing that prayer can be a devotional act. I wanna talk a little bit more about devotional acts in general. Devotional acts and prayer are not necessarily the same. Prayer can obviously take multiple forms, right? Prayers can be mantras, prayer can be uh, doing a hymn, prayer can be reading a psalm, prayer can be even singing. Uh, singing hymns is something that you can do as well and that is a form of prayer. 
Um, but sometimes you can also do devotional acts. They're not the same as prayer, but I think they are connected in a lot of ways. That's like, say, dancing for a spirit or working out in devotion to a spirit. Whatever it is you want to do, those are devotional acts. And I think those do sort of connect to prayer, but they're still not the same. Uh, but they are related concepts, and I think they can go together. Now that we've sort of explained prayer, what it is, who you pray to, and why we do it, I wanted to talk about building a prayer practice because I've sort of just vomited a lot of information at you guys, but I haven't really explained how to actually integrate this into your spiritual practice. So I really suggest starting small and building. In general, when you are creating any sort of spiritual practice, you don't wanna just throw yourself into the deep end. You want to build progressively. When I was talking about daily ritual practices, which prayer tends to integrate into that daily practice with time, you want to build that really slowly, adding one thing at a time. So I would suggest just starting simple. Don't even make the prayer part of your daily practice initially. Just pray every now and again. Let's say you're gonna start praying because you're someone who's really interested in Venus and Venusian things. So you're gonna start your prayer practice just reading the Orphic Hymn to Venus every Friday. And then once you've done that for a while, you're like, okay, I can add to this. Maybe start doing a mantra to Venus. Get a pair of mala beads, which are a set of prayer beads, and every day say a little mantra to Venus. And then once you've kind of got that under your belt, you're like, okay, I've got this and this. Maybe start praying in a more complex way. So maybe make your nightly routine sitting in a certain prayer posture you do your mala, then the Orphic Hymn, and then that's now your daily. So you see it builds and builds. And if you wanna work with more spirits, let's say you've got your Venus devotional, you're like, okay, okay, okay. Now I wanna to connect to my HGA. To prepare for that, I mean, of course, you could jump headfirst into a big HGA procedure like Live or Semek or Viva Melon, but you could also start softly and start with maybe getting, you know, that Orthodox prayer book and reading the canon to the Holy Guardian Angel every day. Add that on top. Now, two months later, you're interested in ancestor veneration. Okay, so you're gonna take some photos of some of your deceased and beloved dead, put them on your altar, and just l give them offerings here and there. And then with time, start praying to them. And then add that to your practice. So your daily prayer practice is building and it's growing. And I find the more you pray, the more it connects to you, the more you get stronger at it. If you've done any sort of ritual, let's say you do a lesser banishing ritual, the pentagram every day, you're going to know that the first time you do that ritual, it is not your best time, right? It takes time to master any spiritual practice. It takes years and years and years. Some mystics literally just pray and that's it. And they are still developing in it. There's even this concept called contemplative prayer, where you will, you know, take a verse of a holy text. I've been doing this with the Book of the Law, and it's a little heretical because it's originally a Christian practice, but I've just decided to do it. And I'll read that verse, and then I'll think about it, and then sort of try to connect with it. And so prayer can get even more complex than just reading something. You can start doing contemplative things. You can start when you pray, do your prayer, then really sink into that visualization. Maybe you're visualizing the spirit while you do your Orphic Hymn, and then you really sink into that, and you let that sort of come and enter into a meditation. Prayer can be used to thrust you into meditation in a way that can add that meditation with a bit of sense of purpose. Because I think a lot of people, when they start meditating, they hear it talked a lot about in spiritual and wellness spaces, and then they just start doing it, and they don't know what it's for. Whereas prayer can give you that preparatory entry. As well, these prayers can be used in larger rituals. Of course, praying a certain thing for a set number of days in and of itself is a form of ritual work. As well, prayers can be used for petitions. Basically, a petition is you're praying for a spirit and then you say, I will give you this in exchange for this. So let's say you decide to pray a thing for a set number of days in exchange for your results. And then on the last day, you give an offering. That can be another way to use prayer. Prayer is not just a devotional thing, but devotion is still valuable. I think a lot of people, when they get into the occult, they get into it to get stuff. They basically want like a spiritual HEM, right? Like I, I put in prayer, I get money. That's not exactly how it works. Instead, you put in prayer and you develop that devotion and then you work with that spirit and you get the things you want. I also have noticed the longer people are occultist, the less they are occultist for material things and the more they fall into mysticism. I know this was true with me. When I first got into the occult, I wanted to make my life better because I was not in the best spot in my life. I was kind of in a rough spot. And I got into the occult because I was like, I want magic. I want magic powers. I want to fix my life. Whereas now there is a heavy mysticism component to my practice. I see my spiritual practice as much more than a way to get things and as a way to devote myself to something higher and to discover my true will. If you have this big goal, like discovering your true will, accomplishing the great work, becoming ascended, right? Whatever it is that goal is, you're not gonna get there without prayer. I know that's a little harsh, but prayer is a critical skill. And I know for some people you have to get over some mental blocks for that, but that is something to work through, right? You don't wanna just let your past and your blocks hold you back from making spiritual growth and in the end attainment.
So as Crowley said, inflame yourself in prayer. He said it a little differently. I kind of modernized that quote, but that's more or less what he said. And trust me, sometimes when you pray, it can feel like you are on fire. Give it time, give it discipline, and give it devotion. At the end, mysticism is the combination of devotion and discipline into something higher and something bigger, something alchemical. That's all I pretty much want to say on this subject. Thank you for watching. Now, you can find me a lot of places. I am starting a new podcast at the beginning of June. It's the second week of June. It should be launching. I'm going to do it on this channel, actually. So basically, I've been uploading here every other week for the past two years, but now I'm going to be doing every week with my videos every other week and my podcast the weeks between. It'll also be on all podcast platforms, so you can find it all sorts of places. You can also find me on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, I'm gonna get back into Twitch streaming eventually, I promise, but I've kind of been off that. I'm also on Telegram. And if you just wanna support me and keep videos like this coming, please join my Patreon. It genuinely really helps. I give extra videos, um, like ritual guides, and early access to all this, as well as more things if you are a high tier patron. Thank you so much for watching. Like, comment, subscribe. And if you're subscribed for 93 days, you'll be your holy guardian angel and you will never need to do a prayer again. All right.